All right, here we go. Welcome to the uh, Monday live stream. This is the Mark series, part 66. And the thing I want to focus on right now is how women were, and don't don't get me wrong, okay? Wait for the explanation here. But women were a, a genuine embarrassment to the message of the empty tomb of Christ in the first century. The modern readers of the Gospels might miss this. We miss a lot when we're reading the Bible because we're, we're from now and they're from then. And we're from here and they're from there. And so the story of the empty tomb was actually pretty embarrassing. And people found it hard to believe because women were the witnesses, the key, the key and chief witnesses to testify to the idea that Jesus' tomb after he was buried was found empty on the third day. Celsus, a second century uh, apologist against Christianity. Yeah, there's apologists for Christianity. There's those, those who are apologists against it. And Celsus was one of the old ones, right? Second century. He said and criticized Christians because they're... Their story was secured by the testimony of, quote, a half frantic woman. That's what he called Mary Magdalene. Now, what's interesting is that when you look at this from our 21st century perspective, what was a weak point in the first century is a strong point from a historical critical understanding of the Gospels now. You see, modern skeptics, they, they still reject the empty tomb. Many of the skeptics will. They'll say it was later legend. But actually, the majority of scholars accept that Jesus really was buried in a known tomb and it was found empty three days later. I want you to think about that for a second. When I say majority of scholars, that doesn't mean they're all Christians. I mean the majority of scholars across all broad spectrums. They think that this empty tomb thing really happened. But the first century issues, the problems they had proclaiming the gospel initially turn out to be more support and strengthening of the gospel and of the fact, the historical fact of the resurrection of Christ nowadays. So this is why like 70, 75% of scholars nowadays affirm the empty tomb. So here we are in our Mark series. What we're going to do is try to read this through first century eyes, try to understand the context of specifically the women over the next few weeks in the Mark series. I'm going to be, as I'm winding up, finishing the gospel of Mark, I'm going to be dealing with a bunch of apologetics related issues. So if you guys like apologetics, you're going to really love what's coming next. If you don't, then maybe you don't want to watch. I don't know. Guess what? You, you get to make that choice. <laughs> so in Mark 15, 40, though, let's just read the passage as we always are doing so we can understand it carefully and thoughtfully and learn to mine the beautiful gems that are here in the scripture for us. So Mark 15, 40 says there were also some women. This is this is them looking on just after Jesus dies. They're watching Jesus die is, is the statement here from a distance among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, the less and Joseph and Salome. And when he was in Galilee, they used to follow him and minister to him. And there were many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. This is just seems mundane to us now, but this is actually super important. I'm, su I'm suggesting that these verses we would just read past and not notice much are actually great pieces of evidence for the truthfulness of Christianity. So let me build the case here. Verse 42, when evening had already come because it was the the preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea came, a prominent member of the council who himself was waiting for the kingdom of God. And he gathered up courage and went in before Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate wondered if he was dead by this time and summoning the centurion, he questioned him as to whether he was already dead. And ascertaining this from the centurion, he granted the body to Joseph. Joseph bought a linen cloth, took him down, wrapped him in the linen cloth, and laid him in a tomb which had been hewn out in the rock. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Now we get back to the women. The women pop back into the story. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, were looking on to see where he was laid. Notice that Salome's not here now. She's the third woman. Verse, uh, chapter 16, verse 1. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome, now she's back, bought spices so that they might come and anoint him very early on the first day. Now, look at what they say. They were saying to one another, who will roll the stone away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? Now, this is interesting because back in the day, I'll just give you guys a quick insight. The, um, at that time, the average woman is like four foot ten and like 90 something pounds. Like that's normal. Okay, that's the average woman back then. Four ten, maybe four eleven. Right? And 90 something pounds. The average man was like five foot six, 135 pounds. There's your, uh, your, your, your typical guy. So they obviously want help. This is a very heavy, you know, stone. It's, it's possible to roll it away and back and they would do this, but you need help. You can't do it just by yourself. It's going to be a big labor. And this is kind of embarrassing for the early church a little bit right here because 
the normally the men who were the followers of Jesus would be there to assist the women with this, but they don't, they're not there. They're hiding. The women go to the tomb, and I'm imagining, and I'm I'm just going to add this here. I'm imagining, but I think it's possible that there were conversations that they had with the men. Come with us to the tomb. We want to anoint the body of Jesus. Where the men said, "No, we refuse. We're we're going to stay in hiding," and they were despondent, uh, and they had they had they had been split up. They had been scattered, so to speak. So this is kind of embarrassing that the men don't show up. And the women just go anyways, but they have this dilemma. Who's going to open the tomb for us? Verse 4, looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, although it was extremely large, uh, probably 1,500 to 3,000 pounds, most likely this stone. We found many stones uh, in archaeology that give us that evidence. Entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting at the right wearing a white robe, and they were amazed. And he said to them, do not be amazed. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who has been crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold, here is the place where they laid him. I, I can just imagine this is this was an angel. We'll talk about that later. But I can imagine this, this angel is pretty excited. He finally gets to do something. Because <laughs> they were kind of held back from helping, helping and assisting. And I think that's pretty, I think, anyway. Just a side thing there. Verse 7, but go tell his disciples and Peter, he's going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. They went out and fled from the tomb for trembling and astonishment had gripped them. And they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. And I'm going to pause there. Um, this is as far as we're going to get. But we're not going to cover everything in the verses we just read. We're going to cover the women offering evidence for the resurrection of Christ. Next week, we'll talk about Joseph of Arimathea and how he is a real historical character and evidence for that because some push against it. We'll talk about Roman burial practices because some people say Jesus never would have been buried in the first place. And that is um, demonstrably problematic when we look at the actual texts, historical texts we'll look at. And then the week after that, we'll look at the, tw the last 12 verses of Mark. Are they authentic? Then we'll look at how we, the, for the verse 8 ending makes sense liter in a literary sense. Then we'll look at how the last 12 verses could be interpreted if we were to take them. All that good stuff. Today we're dealing with how the presence of these women is strong evidence of the historical accuracy of their claims and how they were embarrassing to the early church gives us even more reason to think that they are real historical witnesses. I hope you're tracking with me here. I hope you're tracking with me. If you're looking for just a devotional, where you just, I just want to hear someone read the word and give me something encouraging, like you're on the wrong channel. <laughs> this is not it. I hope I give you that too. But rather, I want us to like mine the scriptures for great and valuable gems of truth that aren't just to make me feel better about my day, but to make me a stronger Christian. And and if you're a non-believer, that you might hear a historical case for the truthfulness of Christianity. So let me now build my case for why these women were um, uh, seen as witnesses in the Gospel of Mark, why they were seen as embarrassing at the time, and why this gives us more evidence to support Christianity. And I'll respond to a few objections from uh, our one of our favorite skeptics, Bart Ehrman, and we'll, we'll respond to that as well, so that you can kind of hear some of the debate played out. So the women witnesses in the Gospel of Mark um, actually... They, they have a very special function. And it and you've already seen the evidence, but you, you may not have noticed it because, again, we're reading it from our first our 21st century perspective instead of the first century. These witnesses, these women, the way that they're recounted, their names are really important. Um, let me now remind us of some stuff I have covered earlier in the, in the Gospel of Mark, but it's been a while. So there's actually a lot of names put in strange places in the Gospel of Mark. Whereas most of the time he leaves people anonymous, but sometimes he gives them names. And the theory of uh, the scholar Richard Bauckham, who wrote a fantastic book called Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, is that, and he offers a lot of support for this evidence, and he, even in his second edition of the book, those who are interested, he responded to objections people brought. So check the end of his book if you've heard objections to his case. But what he says is, and draws tons of evidence to support this, that the names that appear in the Gospel of Mark should be explained by something. Something explains the names. And his theory is these names are best explained by the idea that Mark is appealing to people that were known by the community to whom he's writing. When he originally wrote the Gospel of Mark, and he's telling a story of Jesus doing such and such, if the thing he did involves someone who's known, a living witness, he adds their name to the text. Right, so he doesn't heal most of the people Jesus heals. Don't get named. Here's an example: the uh, the, the the blind men, the paralytic, the people Jesus heals. They're anonymous in Mark, but in Mark 10, for for no apparent reason, I suppose there is a reason. Um, Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, is given a name. We hear his name. Now, what's interesting about this is that he's the only of all these healed people. He's the only one 
who had said that he went and followed Jesus afterwards. So in Mark 10, Jesus heals him and he follows Jesus, which implies that he became part of the Christian community. That's the guy that Mark decides to name and tells you his name. And he's Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, because Bartimaeus is a common name. So he identifies him also by his father's name. That's pretty interesting. Um, the early community of believers would possibly be able to identify him. So the appearance of names has to be explained in the Gospel of Mark, and this is actually throughout all the Gospels. Now, Richard Bauckham has offered a few other things uh, to support this, and I'll briefly mention them as we dig into what I think is wonderful support that was embarrassing in the first century, but is confirmation in the 21st century for the Christians. The, the occurrence of names matches the, the names that people did actually have in Palestine. This implies the names are not invented, they're names of real people. Later, false gospels, fake gospels, we call them Gnostic gospels, these, these legendary accounts, they lose names. Whereas the gospels have, have more names, these have less names. And these fake accounts that came later, 100, 200 years later, they have the wrong names. They use names for people that weren't local to the place of you know, ancient Israel. And so we have more names, which implies history, not legend. We have accurate names, which implies hist historical accuracy and not legend. And then we have names that are of people who are more likely to be involved in the communities. That's kind of a big deal. Here's another example from a recent study we did. Mark 15, 21. This is where we learn about the guy that carries Jesus's cross. In Mark 15, 21, this guy, you remember his name? It's Simon of Cyrene. But then Mark does this. Now, keep in mind, Mark is the shortest gospel. He doesn't waste space. But he decides to spend all this time here, the, these precious words in his, in his limited space to, to write, he decides to tell us the guy's name is Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Why does he tell us who his kids are? He doesn't usually tell people, tell you who people's kids are. That's pretty rare in the Gospels. You're going to hear who someone's children are. It does happen, but it doesn't happen regularly. So Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Well, on Bauckham's thesis, Alexander and Rufus would be the people that are known to the community. That's why Simon is named but we name his sons because guess what? The people reading Mark, the early first century readers of Mark, they know Alexander and Rufus because these are eyewitnesses guaranteeing the truthfulness of the story and of the account, people you could appeal to. Now, tradition says that, uh, and most people agree with this, that Mark was written in Rome. Now, when Paul writes to Rome, he writes to greet Rufus. And he says, greet Rufus, his mother and mine. Rufus's mother had a special relationship with Paul. Now, this this might I'm throwing this out really quick because I want to move forward to the next part of the study. But but let me say this: in in um, Paul's writing to the Romans, there's a decent case that can be made that the Rufus that was in Rome, that was known to Paul, is the same Rufus that Mark writes about. That was the son of Simon of Cyrene, as Mark writes, probably to a Roman community initially. Notice this too, Paul never went to Rome, at least not, he did eventually, but not when he wrote the book of Romans, he had not yet visited. And he knows Rufus, and he knows Rufus's mom, who had apparently t helped take care of Paul during his missionary journeys. And so he's, he's, he says, greet Rufus, his mother and mine, because she's like, was like a mother to him. He's not like his brother, literal brother, but rather like, you know, when you, someone takes care of you a lot, you're like, hey mom, <laughs> That's kind of, that kind of thing. So this implies that um, since Paul hadn't gone to Rome, that Rufus and his mom were known to Paul from his, his time in, in Israel, in ancient Israel. That's interesting. So they probably relocated from perhaps Cyrene or perhaps the area of Jerusalem. They relocated and they went to Rome and were part of the Christian community there. So here, when Mark in 1521 says, Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus, it's a sensical explanation of, of the addition of these names that these are just people that were known to those in Rome because they had relocated and they were they were there to tell the story. Yeah, my dad always told me about how uh, he was on his way to do whatever and the Romans grabbed him and made him carry Jesus' cross and they guarantee the story. Here's more evidence that'll help us. The, um, the women suddenly start appearing and getting names in Mark chapter 15. Before that, the women are not named. Now, they've been around the whole time. According to Mark uh, chapter 15, verse 40, let's look at and see what we learn about them. Again, we're like kind of doing historical research here, not just like Bible study, but I think sometimes the two mix together. So there's women and they get names. Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, the less, and Joseph, right? Salome, these three women. 
But look at what Mark says about him. When he was in Galilee, they used to follow him and minister to him. And there were many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. Now, Mark earlier didn't talk about groups of women in Galilee. He waits until now. And there's a reason why he waits till now. Mark's writing is very smart. The reason why he seems to wait till now is because now he needs them as key witnesses in the resurrection accounts because they were the ones that were really there. So let me try to build this case a little bit. <laughs> we're getting a little heavy today with some of this stuff. It might seem vague if you've never heard it before, but try to track with it. Um, as I've made the case in the first part of the Mark series, which is linked down below in the video description, you can watch part one if you like about who wrote Mark and how Peter was his, his chief witness. Peter's the guy who seems to be the chief witness. Uh, Mark begins and ends with mentions of Peter as a witness. Um, and then throughout, Peter seems to be one of the chief witnesses of Mark. When Peter's not around and he's not experiencing something, we tend to get other witnesses named so that the reader of Mark would see there's an appeal to witnesses. When Peter ditches Jesus, as Jesus goes to the cross and Peter denies him three times and then he's nowhere to be seen, I mean, he's not around Jesus, so he can no longer be used by Mark or anybody as a witness of what happened next. That's when Mark, even though these women have been around the whole time, that's when Mark decides to name and mention these women because the women are functioning in the gospel of Mark as historical witnesses with real names known to real people at the time. This is a really big deal because it's a casual thought amongst many people in the world today that the Bible is full of content that is just basically made up. But they haven't really thoroughly looked at these types of details. And that's what we're doing today. So the women are mentioned there, whereas they were never mentioned before because they are witnesses. Now, let me mention before I move on, the women, it says they used to follow him. The word follow there is kind of a loaded term. It's suggesting that these women weren't just following like going wherever Jesus went, but rather they were disciples of Christ. Um, back then, rabbis didn't have like traveling teachers. They didn't really have women disciples. Jesus did. He had women who were disciples of his. And we have a really interesting account in, um, in the Gospels that relates to this. And we, again, with our 21st century eyes, we read right past it and don't see the value of it. But this is where Jesus is having the discussion with Mary and Martha. And uh, Mary, Mary's sitting at the feet of Jesus, and she is receiving teaching. This is Mary of um, Bethany, different Mary than the ones we have here. But Mary is sitting at Jesus' feet and listening to his teachings, and Martha is be being the hostess. She's helping serve food and stuff like that around the house. And she tells Jesus, you know, Lord, tell my sister to help me. And this is, in their culture, normal, because, right, it's not the woman's focus to be a disciple and a learner. It's rather she's going to be over here helping to take care of the needs of the home. Well, what's really cool about this is Jesus' response to her is, you know, you're busy about many things, Martha, but Mary has chosen the best thing and I'm not gonna take it from her. Jesus explicitly affirms her sitting at his feet and listening and learning. And this is consistent with Mark that she had that Jesus had women followers who would sit and be discipled by him. When he taught crowds, he taught men and women. And um, the early church is known for educating women beyond what they were getting education in their culture. So this is just kind of a cool side thing. Um, this might sound to some people like I'm trying to appeal to 21st century feminism. Well, I'm about to insult all your all your feminism in a minute. My point is I want to be Christian above all else. And so um, there's ways in that first century Christianity kicked against its culture. It actually elevated women. And there's ways that it's going to kick against 21st century feminism as well. It's, we're just, just going to be our own thing. We're not going to fit you all. So get over it. All right. Um, let's, let's move forward. There's more here. There's Peter who goes away, right? Then we have women who show up and they're named now and only named now. And this is the first time Mark explicitly mentions women followers of Jesus. Three of them are mentioned watching Jesus die. Only two of them are mentioned watching the burial and three of them are mentioned watching the empty tomb. That's in verse 47. Okay. So, let me show you briefly my point about this. Um, the women were looking on. They see Jesus die. It's Mary, Mary, and Salome. These two Marys and Salome. And then when we read on, the empty tomb comes. And it's just the two Marys. They see Jesus being laid in the tomb. And Salome is not there. And then when Jesus is going to be raised or the empty tomb is found, it's all three of them again. Why is this significant? Because I think this is another subtle mark of historicity. Because if you are going to explain what's happening in Mark's gospel, you have to explain why Salome doesn't appear 
She's, they're obviously being used as witnesses. Why doesn't she appear in the second part of the story where the tomb is being um, located? You're seeing where Jesus is laid. And they're, they're, the simplest answer, I mean, the easiest answer when you read the text is, oh, well, she just wasn't there. Mark would have liked to include a third witness, but he doesn't include her because while she might be known to the community, she wasn't at that specific thing. Now, there was other women, but maybe those women aren't named because they weren't known to the early community at the time. They were not known to the, the Roman Christians, perhaps. Um, they didn't become well known to, to the Jewish Christians even. And so, um, yeah, there you go. You, you, you've got just a simple example of historicity in the lack of the name Salome. She's not mentioned because she just wasn't there. Uh, Richard Bauckham also points out, and I really want to highlight this because you'll realize sometimes that when you're reading the Gospels or reading the Bible in general, there's tons you're missing because we go, we, we, and I've done this many times myself, and I'm, it's not that it's wrong, it's just that it's narrow, okay? We go to the text of Scripture looking for a devotional affirmation, something that will help me grow today, help me, help me feel um, like, like I've been ministered to, like I've got a fresh word from the Lord today. But that is not the only purpose of Scripture. And so we miss a lot of really neat things. So here's Mark, again, showing us that these women function as historical witnesses. So Jesus dies, and um, what Richard Bauckham points out is that, and he's not the only one who's pointed this out, but that Mark uses verbs of seeing or witnessing verbs constantly of the women. They're looking on from a distance. That is, they see Jesus, and, and the term looking on here is, is like not just they glanced, but rather they're, they're staring at it, okay? They, they watch Jesus dying. Then when we get to verse 47, the next event is the tomb, right? And they're looking on to see where he was laid. So they're functioning as witnesses to see. And then we see it again in verse um, uh, verse 4. Looking up, now they're at the empty tomb now. The tomb's empty. They look up. They saw that the stone had been rolled away. So again, they're, they're functioning as witnesses. In verse 5, they enter the tomb and the young man, they see the young man. Right? They doesn't just say there's a young man there. The, stu- to- the stone had been rolled away. It says they saw, they looked. These are the important words. Verse 6, he says to them, are you looking for Jesus? Right? He's risen. He's not here. But here's what they can look at. They can come look at the place where they laid him. Then in verse 7, they're going to go and tell the disciples that what's going to happen in Galilee, they will see him. So it's all about verbs of looking. Now, this is consistent in all of the Gospels. The women appear as Peter falls away, as the other apostles, many of them fall away. The women show up and they're there to witness where Jesus, that Jesus dies, where he is buried, and that his tomb is empty afterwards. This is in Matthew 27, 55 and 28, 1. This is in uh, Matthew 28, 6 as well. It's in the Mark passages I share with you. And it's in Luke 23, 49 and 55 that they especially use verbs of looking and seeing, witnessing verbs of the women. Why is this significant? I hope I'm not beating a dead horse here, which seems very rude. It's significant because they're witnesses. The names indicate it. The presence of, of, of women after Peter falls away indicates it. The, um, the way everything that's being recorded is saying these are, these are like eyewitnesses. These women really witness these things. So this, on a side note, this actually helps support the idea that Peter is functioning as a witness. Because if, if you're going to affirm the women are witnesses here and that Mark is using them as actual witnesses, eyewitnesses, then that means that Peter's more likely the witness of the bulk of Mark's content because it's when Peter disappears that we have other witnesses, right? Peter's not there following Jesus to the, to the cross, to the location of the cross where it'll be placed. And so we have Simon of Cyrene. We have his name mentioned, right? It's when Peter's not there that we have these other witnesses especially show up. Um, so there's more evidence uh, why this isn't made up. And it has to do with something called uh, that historians will call the criterion of embarrassment. Um, and some do use the phrase and some don't use the phrase. But, but you don't really need to learn ancient history to, to know this. If I tell you a story about how I caught this gigantic fish, you may wonder if I'm telling you the truth or not. If I tell you the story about how I did something terribly embarrassing and I'm embarrassed by it, you generally just accept that it's true. And the reason for this is because we understand that people generally don't tell stories that are lies that hurt their reputation. The women at the tomb is an embarrassment to the early Christians. And I would like to build the case now for why it's an embarrassment. Now, if it, the more embarrassing it is, the more reason you have to think it's historically accurate. Even if you don't believe the Bible is God's word, those who are skeptics listening in, I hope you'll consider this. 
So um, if you were in the first century culture and you wanted to make up a story of Jesus's tomb being empty, you would probably pick really good people to witness that event. You might narrate it with no witnesses, but then again, that, that looks weak. So you want to narrate it with witnesses. So you might say like, Peter, he was the one who saw it. Or maybe it was one of the, uh, the opposition. Maybe it's like um, the elders, the high priest himself is there and he sees it. Like, you, you know, you'd make this up because that's a better story than the women. Now, here's why the women were so bad as witnesses in the first century. Obviously, I'm not saying women are bad witnesses, but I'd like us to understand the context of the Bible. So the cultural context. Now, the Bible doesn't consider them bad witnesses. Obviously, the Bible's using them as witnesses. Hello. <laughs> but the culture did. So among the Jews, we read in the Mishnah, which, which gives us kind of understanding of the Jewish culture of the time. We, we read a list of people that are considered bad witnesses. This is in Rosh Hashanah 1.8, if you'd like to look it up in the Mishnah. It says, these are considered unfit witnesses. And here's the list. Gamblers with dice. Those that lend with interest, pigeon racers, pigeon racers, interesting study, you could look into that. Uh, those who trade in the produce of the sabbatical year and slaves. Okay, women weren't on that list, right? But, but listen to what it says next. This is the rule. All the testimony that a woman is not fit to give, these are also not fit to give. So enlisting a bunch of people to not trust in court, they compare them to women. That was the attitude they had towards women. This was the cultural attitude they had towards women. So do you understand why basing the tomb of Jesus, the burial in the empty tomb on these women witnesses was considered like an embarrassment? Now, the critics will respond to this. And I've, I've, I've tried to look and be aware of what, what criticisms are coming against the case for Christianity, right? So the critics respond to this and they say, but Mike, this is in a courtroom and the women are not functioning as witnesses in a courtroom. They're just functioning as witnesses in normal life. Now, women could be trusted in normal life, but I'm going to say that this is this is missing the point entirely. Like, it's not as though the prejudice against women was only happening in the courtroom. The reason it happened in the courtroom was because it was an overall cultural prejudice against the trustworthiness of women in general. And it was, and we can support it with lots of other evidence. So, Josephus says that the reason that women were not credible witnesses is because they are just too lighthearted and brash. This is his terms, too lighthearted and brash. He's a first century Roman Jewish historian. Twice though, interestingly enough, he uses women as witnesses. Now some skeptics would bring this up. Say Josephus used women as witnesses to talk about the slaughter at Gamala and Masada, these two events of terrible slaughters. But what's interesting is why he used women as witnesses. Josephus used women in his histories as witnesses in these two events, not other places really, but in these two places, because all the men were dead. There were the slaughters at Gamala and Masada. So the men are all dead. So he appeals to women because he has no other option. That sounds like what's going on here, even in the gospels. Like, well, they were the witnesses. We have to use them. So he doesn't want to use them, but he has to because they're the only ones available. To show you Josephus's bias, that shows you some Jewish bias at the time, he even changed the book of Genesis in his recounting of it so that uh, instead of Rebecca receiving revelation from God, Isaac receives revelation from God, right? God speaks to Rebecca directly, but he makes it Isaac who's getting the message from God. And that's in his Josephus, the Antiquities book, uh, 1, 257. And you can check that out if you like. Now, among Gentiles, it was pretty much the same. It, among the, the non-Jewish people, this wasn't just a Jewish bias but it was among the Gentiles as well. And Richard Bauckham says the following, that women were regarded as, quote, gullible in religious matters and especially prone to superstitious fantasy and excessive in religious practices. In other words, you don't want to make the truthfulness of important claims about your religion in that culture. You don't want it to be based on the testimony of women due to the prejudice that is going on at the time. Celsus, I told you about this guy earlier, Celsus is a guy alive in the second century that cannot stand Christianity. He's a pagan, and uh, he sounds a lot like a modern atheist almost, but when you read him, he's actually a pagan. But Celsus was an apologist against Christianity, and him and Origen go back and forth, right? So Origen, he says that Celsus's complaint against Christianity is that the resurrection of Jesus is at least partly dependent on Mary Magdalene, who is, quote, a half-frantic woman, as you state. This is, this is the quote from Origen. So Celsus goes, we can dismiss your account of the resurrection because it involves the testimony of a half frantic woman. This can only be said in a culture that considers her testimony unreliable in the first place, not just in court, but in general.
And he also says this, Origen says, only foolish about who gets who are who are the Christians? Only foolish and low individuals and persons devoid of perception and slaves and women and children are those of whom the teachers of the divine word wish to make converts. These are the people they want to get make saved. This actually, like I said, sounds like modern atheism. When you go onto modern atheist websites, especially some of the really lowbrow stuff, you 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 get major mocking against Christians. Christians are idiots. Christians they just need a religious crutch. It's it's a lot of. Um, superiority of 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 unbelief that unbelievers are like like the the intellectual elite which is interesting because i think the christian perspective is supposed to guard us from thinking that because we're in we're in the right we're therefore intellectually elite because the door into christianity is humility and repentance but often a, a door out of christianity for people is intellectually feeling as though you're you've 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 kind of overcome all the stupidity of religion and all that kind of thing. And so we have sometimes a lot of arrogance that carries in those crowds. Um, just being real with y'all. So even uh, the disciples, though, give us more evidence of this. Let me look at a specific verse for you. So you can imagine in the first century how much it hurt Christianity to have these women as witnesses for an important part of the gospel. Luke twenty four eleven. These words appear to them as nonsense and they would not believe them. What are they not believing? They're not believing Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the one who tell who, the ones who tell them, "Hey, Jesus is not in his tomb; he has risen." This is what they don't believe. The apostles themselves, who know these women, do not believe them. Think about this. This talk about embarrassing. This just really happened. Okay, the the leaders of the future leaders of the church who will die for their testimony of the resurrection of Christ didn't believe it when women told them. Yet here's women securing part of the story. Of the death and resurrection of Jesus. Very embarrassing and a weak spot in the first century, well, but it is a strong point now. I'm glad. I think God wrote the word of God. He had it written in such a way that it would be useful then and useful now so that it would withstand criticism then and withstand criticism now. So the reason that the story lost credibility in the first century is why it's more credible today. To ignore this is to just I think, miss something that seems very obvious when you read these types of sources. Richard Bauckham says the following, Since these narratives do not seem well designed to carry conviction of the time, they are likely to be historical. That is believable by people with a historically critical mindset today. When you look at it and you go, look, nobody invented this story to get you to believe it. Then why is it this written this way? Because that's just what happened. Why did Josephus grudgingly use women witnesses in two different events because they were the only ones he had available. He just had to. And so this is what's going on. God saw fit to put this in there, which ends up being a, str a stronger evidence now. Um, Bauckham also gives lists of scholars who say the same thing. They support the idea that we should believe that, and again, it's, it's like 70 something percent of scholars nowadays agree that the women really did visit the tomb and it really was found empty. It was the right tomb and it was found empty. That's kind of a big deal for the resurrection evidence. We have a, tr a real death, a real empty tomb, and the disciples who really say, I really believe I really saw him. And they seem to be very sincere. This is important evidence for the resurrection of Christ, if you care about such things. Bakum also says this. And this is, this is where, I mean, you know, I look for people pushing back against the evidence of the women as witnesses for today's study. And um, I found Bart Ehrman, but he's, he's not much of a serious opponent of this view, but he does go against it, but not very seriously. And, and here's what Bauckham says. He says that, quote, serious attempts to refute this argument are surprisingly rare. There are scholars who will dismiss it, but it's very rare to find someone who tries to refute it, quote, seriously, seriously. Now, Ehrman does suggest and here's his alternate thesis, is that women invented the story of women at the tomb. He's like, who would want to invent the story? And he goes, well, women would. And his perception is that ancient women put, you know, they, they, um, they felt a need to have the story of the empty tomb because it helps support the bodily resurrection of Christ. That's something Ehrman says. And so women, who he thinks are, you know, in prominent roles in the early church, and they were in prominent, depends on what you mean by that word, they're in prominent roles in the early church, and then he says, okay, well, then it's these women that are inventing the story, right? Because women want to put women in those roles. Here's the problem with this. That with no evidence to support it, I mean, literally not a scrap of evidence, just a theory thrown out there with no evidence. I mean, I've offered evidential support for everything <clears throat> I've shared so far. Um, that projects 21st century feminism 
onto first century people. See, nowadays, we often see a woman who does really well in sports, and it's common to hear her say, like, I'm doing this for women everywhere, or they said we couldn't do it, I'm breaking the glass ceiling. And we have this kind of, like, um, this trope, this, like, thing that goes on in our culture now, which is that women, like, are, you know, breaking the glass ceiling. This projecting that attitude onto women in the first century is, is strange, okay? I just don't think women in the first century were going, like, I... Look, I picked up this big heavy thing. I'm proving that women can do things. Like, it just wasn't on their mind. They, I don't think they cared that much, surprisingly enough. <laughs> and so the idea that if women were inventing a story, they would have an internal bias to put women in those roles in order to, like, elevate women or something is to total 21st century feminism thing. What would probably happen if a woman wanted to invent a story to help secure the evidence for the bodily resurrection, they would have invented better witnesses than women because they too, being in that culture, would have thought that their own testimonies were not as reliable and not as convincing to people. This is not, um, this is not meant to insult anybody. I'm not saying women's testimonies are unreliable or anything like that. Obviously, God thought they were reliable enough to put them in the text. But that would be their cultural view. So I don't want to read first century women as if they're 21st century women. I think that that is a big mistake. Um, he also suggests in uh, Bart Ehrman's article that um, this is on his on his blog. You have to pay to access it, but um, that it wasn't a big deal. There's are two really strange claims he makes. I want you to think about these for a minute. Think critically about this. A, it was not a big deal that the story was unbelievable that women were at the center of the story because Mark was not written for unbelievers to convince them, but for believers. Okay, that that's claim one. Oh, okay, so. They, yes, it was unbelievable, but they didn't care that it was unbelievable. Now, you could push back on this and say, but Mark is using them as witnesses. So he obviously cares about the believability of it when he's naming witnesses. But let's ignore that for a second and point out Ehrman's second claim and how it contradicts his first claim. He says that one of the reasons why they invented the story of the empty tomb after the fact was to help support that Jesus was bodily raised. So on one hand, on one hand, Ehrman says, these aren't being used as as like convincing accounts meant to con meant to teach you to believe something you don't already believe. They're not being used in that way. On the other hand, he says, the reason they made up the empty tomb was to convince you to believe that Jesus had bodily raised. This is within the same article. These 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 are these are contradictory accounts. Now, you might push against Ehrman and say, hey, your your um you know your your case is not good here. But Ehrman acknowledges the same thing because he says, is this likely? No, it's not very likely, but his conclusion is, but it's better than a resurrection. And this is where we find out that some of the pushback against the resurrection of Christ is really just anti-miracle pushback. Like they just, anything is better than a resurrection. I've heard this countless times from skeptics online. Anything's better than a resurrection. When you meet somebody who thinks, I don't care how unlikely my theory is, but it's better than a resurrection. What you really have is bias, supreme, total, anti-miracle bias is ruling their thinking here. It's not about evidence. For that, there's a video I've linked below, a wonderful, fun, and well-done video by David Wood called Scooby-Doo and the Case of the Silly Skeptic. And I, I would encourage you guys actually honestly to check it out because if we're going to ignore evidence because we just think miracles are so unbelievable, we have to acknowledge this is bias. This is not about evidence. This isn't about facts. This is just bias. I refuse to believe, and that is my evidence against your beliefs. And that's circular. So it's a reasonable conclusion that the story of the women finding the tomb is included in the Gospels because it was simply part of the story. They were stuck with women witnesses, whether they liked it or not, and God, in his brilliance, saw fit to put these women in the story to have them there at the tomb so that we would have even more evidence 2,000 years later, even though it was embarrassing in the first century. Um, it was too strong, strongly known and too widespread to not be included. So let me talk briefly about who these women are, and then I want to show you what a legendary account from the second century of the resurrection of Christ looks like. Because when you compare that to the Gospels, you'll be like, oh, that's what legend looks like. Not the story of the women. That's not legend. That looks like history. So the women are <clears throat> Mary Magdalene. Um, you, many of you know a lot about Mary. Uh, seven demons cast out of her, and she was from the town, a town in the Sea of Galilee called Magdala. That's her name, Mary Magdalene. So she's probably, most likely, from Magdala, that town. Mary, the mother of James the Less and Joseph. Now, her sons are not known to us. That that woman, uh, James and Joseph, we don't really know for sure who they are. It's not probably James the Apostle. That seems extremely unlikely. But her sons are included because Mark is telling you, he's, he's signaling to us now, 
that her sons are part of the Christian community and they're known. Now, they're not known in the Bible. You don't read about them in Acts. You don't read about them in any other of the, of the scriptures. They're just known to the real living people in the first century so they could testify, oh yeah, mom was there. She told us this about it. So this is probably why she's introduced with reference to her sons instead of her town or her, um, her, her husband or something else because her sons are known by the community. Then Salome is also introduced. Now from Matthew 27, 56, we, 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 uh, we get the following about Salome. So we can know a little bit about her. Among them was Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. Now this is interesting because this seems to be the same account. Okay, this is this woman. <clears throat> we have the two Marys. Matthew records these women as well. They, they all record a little differently. We'll come back to that in a minute. All the, the gospels um, and how that actually helps the case. But Matthew 27, 56 seems to imply that Salome is the same woman who is the mother of the sons of Zebedee. So Zebedee's known, the sons are known. These are actually two of Jesus' uh, apostles. So Salome seems to be well known enough by Mark's audience that he doesn't even offer any extra information about her. She's just Salome. Um, that, that's interesting. <clears throat> now, some people suggest that she's the same also as the woman from John 19.25. I don't think this is the case. A lot of people blur together the women in the Bible and three different women take on one woman's information. Um, and this might be a, that happening here. So um, standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. And some suggest that she is his mother's sister, that Salome is also mm -hmm. the sister of Mary, which would mean that her sons, the sons of Zebedee, James and John are Jesus's cousins. I think that this is pretty far-fetched, and most people do. This isn't just me. I'm not just ruling, telling you all what to believe. I, I, I mean, that seems obviously false, and most people would agree. So a very weak connection there. Um, and plus, uh, John's talking about a different thing, not, not the tomb. He's talking about the cross. So in response then, before I move on to the legend stuff, um, atheists online have often said to me, and, and, and I'm not trying to rip on you all, okay? Listen, you've asked the questions. Here's some answers for you. You say, like, why don't the authors of the Gospels cite their sources? Why doesn't St. Mark, for instance, tell us who his sources are for the information he gives? And the reality is that they've assumed that Mark is so far removed from the community that they've missed how Mark is actually citing his sources. All the time, he's giving us his sources. The sources were the actual eyewitnesses who watched Jesus die, who saw where he was buried, who came to his tomb and found it empty unexpectedly, right? They didn't think it was going to happen. They brought burial stuff. They brought stuff to anoint his body because they thought Jesus was dead. They weren't hopeful about his resurrection. And yet they found him risen. And I think it's, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. Mark does. He offers his eyewitnesses. And there are multiple eyewitnesses he appeals to. And that is pretty powerful evidence to first an event 2,000 years ago. Now, some would say, okay, but I still think it's legend. Um, now, I've already mentioned the issue of the names. There's a bunch of reasons why the names themselves are evidence. Then there's the issue of embarrassment and how the embarrassment implies it was, it was a historical thing that really happened. There's a couple other things I'll mention, though. One is that Mark provides us with an unbroken story. Um, now, that might not sound like a big deal, but remember as you read Mark that some stuff's kind of staccato. It's like a musical term. It's meaning it's just like it tells a story, break. There's another story, break. There's another story. But uh, as, as several scholars have pointed out, Mark's narrative of the passion, right, which, which is where Jesus, he's betrayed. He goes to the cross. He he's goes on trial, goes to the cross. He's buried and he rises from the dead. That whole thing is one section in Mark's gospel, one literary section meaning that it was all cohesively together at the same time. Um, so if the empty tomb is invented, then it doesn't make sense that it's one cohesive section with the crucifixion account itself, which is entirely historical. So this is this would be a strange claim. Rudolf Pesch, one scholar, he actually dates this whole section, the Passion Narrative, to not being written but originating within seven years, within, could be one year, within seven years of the crucifixion of Jesus. And his reason for this, part of the reason for this, is not just that it's one narrative, but also that the high priest is never named. So in Mark's uh, account, we, we get the high priest, the high priest, but we don't get his name. If you were to mention the high priest um, past seven years after Jesus, you would mention him by name because it was no longer Caiaphas. Caiaphas ruled until 37. He was no longer high priest after that. 
this is kind of like in America where we have presidents in the US. So if I say the president right now, I mean President Biden. If I said the president a year ago, I would mean President Trump. If I said president you know, five years before that, I would mean Obama. And when you talk about the president in office, you just say the president. Everybody knows who you mean. But if you talk about a former president, you use his name. And they would typically do the same thing as well. Mark doesn't do this. This implies that Mark's account originates from before Caiaphas was out of, out of the office. What we're saying here is the account is too early for it to be legend. Legend doesn't come that quickly. So um, another argument, this is interesting, Bart Ehrman uses this. He, he says on the, idea, on the idea, assuming that it's true, that women are the ones who anoint bodies for burial typically, then therefore Ehrman says, so it's natural that women would be invented as the ones who go to the empty tomb. Now I want you to pause for a second and see the problem with this reasoning. The reasoning is, boy, this account looks like it's the kind of thing that historically did happen. Therefore, it's made up. If I told you I was 16 when I got my license, and you said, boy, when Mike got his license, 16 was the early, earliest driving age for his state of California. Therefore, Mike made it up. Do you see the problem here? <laughs> I'm just going to move on. Um, now, finally, I'll say this. Mark's narrative shows no signs of legendary development. And to show you what legendary development really looks like, it doesn't look like an embarrassing story with witnesses being named from an early account, probably within seven years of the, of the, uh, of the events themselves, with historical consistency about this is the kind of thing that would happen. It, you know, it doesn't look like that. Here's what a legend looks like. This is from the Gospel of Peter. Peter's one of those ooky spooky gospels that didn't, quote, they like to say this online, didn't make it into the Bible make it into the Bible like this. I don't know what they're imagining the, the inspiration of scripture being like. Um, the gospel of Peter was not written by Peter. Nobody thinks it was. Nobody. Nobody does. Unless you're just, you're, you're, on, you're, you're the only guy if you think it does. Um, but the gospel of Peter is written much, much later. Um, it was given the name of Peter because the people trying to hijack Christianity wanted to assign a, an important apostle to their fake gospel. But here's what it looks like. This is, this is a weird teaching. This is what legendary development looks like. From the Gospel of Peter, um, second century document, starting in 35, section 35, verse 35. But in the night in which the Lord's day dawned, when the soldiers were safeguarding it two by two in every watch, there was a loud voice in heaven, and they saw that the heavens were opened and that two males who had much radiance had come down from there and come near the sepulcher. So there's guards guarding the tomb, right? But what's, what's the legendary thing here is they hear a voice from heaven and they see heaven opened up and then two angels come down. Verse 37, but that stone which had been thrust against the door having rolled by itself when a distance off to the side and the sepulcher opened and both the young men entered. So the stone just flies away on its own, just kind of like just goes off on its own. And listen to this. This is what legendary development looks like. We can track it, right? And it's not in Mark. It's not in the gospels. It's in the second century stuff. And so uh, those soldiers, having seen, awakened the centurion and the elders, for they too were present safeguarding. Remember the weakness of women as witnesses? Well, here we have new witnesses, right? Now, obviously, the guards, Matthew talks about the guards being present, but he's not using them as witnesses because, I mean, they're not named. They're not being offered as people that the, the, the later Christians are going to go interview. Um, but here... The, 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 the antis are raised and the soldiers are there and the centurion is there and the elders of Israel are there. Everybody's sleeping at the tomb of Jesus in the gospel of Peter. Like the elders don't go home that night. They camp out at the tomb of Jesus. The centurion himself is there. Everyone's there. This is to make better witnesses, so to speak, or make, make the count seem more convincing. Although it's written after all these people are dead. So doesn't help as much. Then verse 39 says, And while they were relating what they had seen again, they say they see three males who've come out from the sepulcher. So two went in, three come out, with two supporting the other one. So Jesus is coming out, and he's like leaning on these angels. But listen to how they're described. Oh, and a cross following them. <laughs> There's literally, the cross was in the tomb with Jesus in this account, and it comes out of the tomb on its own. On its own. It comes out of the tomb, and it's going to talk in a minute. The cross will literally talk, according to the Gospel of Peter. You wonder why it's not in the Bible? Because <laughs> it's a complete fabrication is why. 
because they did care about what was real. Um, verse 40, and the head of the two, the two men reaching unto heaven, but the head of the one being led out by, by hand, by them going beyond the heavens. Jesus comes out of the tomb, which is arguably pretty small. When he comes out, he enlarges and becomes higher than the clouds. This is what legendary development looks like. And they were hearing a voice from the heavens saying, and God says, right, have you made proclamation to the fallen asleep? Did you, did you preach to those who had died? This, this comes from um, uh, 2 Peter, 1 Peter, 1 Peter, I think. Um, and an obeisance was heard from the cross or a response from the cross. And the cross literally speaks here at the end of, of this, this quote from the gospel of Peter. The cross goes, yes. It turns out that in the gospel of Peter, the cross was buried in the tomb with Jesus and the cross became animated, went to the tomb and was part of preaching to, went to the grave or went to the place of the dead and then preached to those who'd fallen asleep. Then it comes out of the cross, out of the um, tomb on its own and it speaks. This is what legendary development looks like. When you read Mark, you're just reading history. You're just reading what actually happened. And I think it's neat that even though they would have had motive to change the story to make it more believable, they didn't do it. They shared what actually happened. There are those who are anti-miracle. They just have kind of atheistic assumptions and they're, they can project on this. But this is actually pretty strong historical evidence. And we're not even close to done. Not even close to done. Yes, this is just what happened. But we're going to get it next week into Roman burial practices, Joseph of Arimathea, how the tomb of Jesus fits the archaeology of the time. We may have even found it in Jerusalem. There's a decent chance we have. We're going to talk about all that. And um, there's a major lesson about this, though, that I, I hope we can take home. Something that might encourage your hearts. Um, and that is this. Think of the first Christians. They were told that Jesus was going to die and rise. And it just didn't click. They didn't get it. Maybe they didn't believe it. Maybe they thought it was allegory. Uh, maybe they just pushed it out of their minds because it was so hard for them to swallow because they had such cultural expectations about the Messiah. But they were told Jesus was going to die. And none of them expected it. Not the disciples and no, not even the women. They're, you know, everyone wants to present them like they're then the women are making women the heroes. They're not the heroes. They're just the witnesses. They came there because they thought Jesus was dead. So they're not believing here. When they saw the cross, it was such a horrific thing. When Jesus died, it was such a terrible, horrible, and it was terrible and horrible. Such a terrible thing that they lost hope. And God brought the best thing ever out of the worst thing ever with the cross. And the message to us right now is this, is like you are sometimes in your life, you're in situations that are like them. Between the cross and the tomb, the thing is dead, the suffering has gone on, the pain is present, and you can't even conceive of how God would use this for his, for his good, for your good, for his glory in the world. You can't even conceive of it. And my statement to you is this, is you don't have to conceive of how God works all things together for good but you are called to trust that he does. And it gives us kind of a biblical optimism in our lives where we don't sugarcoat anything. We don't pretend things are good when they're not good, but we, we have hope no matter how dark it gets because we know that the death of the Son of God brought the, brought the light of the world to us. And so I know that whatever's going on, I can trust that God is at work. I can trust him because he's proven himself. And we sometimes get on the disciples like, why didn't they just believe him? Why they just? And God tells you like, I'm working all things together for good to those who love me and are called according to my purpose. And, and, you're, and, and you got to say to yourself, why don't I just believe him? Why don't I just believe him? We're the same. We go through the same issues. God's gracious with us. But the question is, will I learn to trust? Trust is something that is sometimes learned very slowly over years. And um, I pray that you're learning to trust. Next week, we'll deal with uh, Joseph of Arimathea, Roman burial practices. That's coming next week. All kinds of skeptical things that I think, in the end, support the truthfulness of the Christian faith. And let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word, for the fact of the resurrection of Christ, that the tomb is empty, and that, that it stands there vacant as a testimony of the victory of the Son of God, who died for our sins and rose from the dead. Jesus, we believe in you. We believe in the truth of it all. No matter what folly the world thinks it is, no matter how embarrassing it may seem, Lord, we trust. And we thank you. We pray that we would have the... Um, the hope of the resurrection of Christ would impact our attitudes towards all the suffering that we see in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you guys all for coming. Um, and that's about it. All I got for you. Pop a video up on Wednesday. And then Friday, we have the q and I'm answering your questions from the live chat. Not today, but every Friday. I'll answer 20. I know I can't get half of the ones that are sent in, but I'll do what I can. <laughs>
So thank you all, and thanks, thanks, mods, for being there.